so um, thanks for sticking around. And I'm really sorry that I couldn't be around in person at this wonderful conference. And uh, thanks also to uh, Jakob for introducing QRE to the, to the audience. So <clears throat> a large experimental literature documents deviations from Nash equilibrium, which has, of course, inspired many alternative uh, solution concepts that better explain what we observe in the data. One of the most successful uh, being QRE or quantal response equilibrium, which is the subject of this talk. Uh, what is QRE? Well, it's nothing more than an equilibrium with noisy players. So players make probabilistic mistakes and best responding to their beliefs, but beliefs are correct, taking into account others' mistakes. QRE explains many well-known deviations from Nash equilibrium that have been observed in the lab. And so QRE has become a common tool in the analysis of experimental data. In, in our view, QRE should also be regarded as an important theoretical benchmark in that it deviates from Nash equilibrium in a minimalistic way, <clears throat> but it's actually very rarely used in uh, applied theory uh, applications. So we speculate this is because existing variants of QRE tend to either be um, very intractable for theoretical applications, and that's why you see a lot of work on their computation. <clears throat> or uh, existing QRE models make very weak predictions. So as soon as you inject some noise into best response, uh, there's in some sense too much flexibility in the predictions that can be made. So ideally we would like a version of QRE that's, uh, that balances these two desirable qualities, uh, a model which is both precise in its predictions and is also uh, tractable for theoretical applications. So we're gonna offer a model that uh, hopefully makes a contribution in this direction. Uh, we call this model symmetric QRE. So it's a completely non-parametric theory in that the noise structures uh, are not restricted to satisfy any functional form. They're only restricted to satisfy a few weak conditions uh, or restrictions that the uh, literature has referred to as axioms. So symmetric QRE is based on some standard axioms as well as some novel axioms that impose various symmetries across players and actions. So I'll argue that these axioms are natural in that they can be microfounded, and, and in fact are satisfied by all the common parametric models. Um, so by studying symmetric QRE, we have implications for understanding these models as well. And that's a nice thing because these models are uh, intractable in, in this sense. I'm also gonna argue that this model is fairly practical in that it makes uh, precise predictions that are relatively easy to, to characterize. Uh, and to illustrate this, we offer a number of uh, theoretical applications. And so if there's time, I'll uh, talk about one application in particular. Okay. So let me very quickly review QRE, and then we'll be well-placed to explain our contribution. So this is a, an asymmetric matching pennies game. So a two by two game, uh, two players with two actions each and there's a unique uh, Nash equilibrium in mixed strategies. The exact payoffs are unimportant, but the Nash equilibrium for this example is for uh, player two to move left with probability 0.18 and for player one to move up with probability 0.64. So we can plot the Nash equilibrium in this space, the unit square, whereby the, the horizontal axis is the probability player two moves left and the vertical axis is the probability with which player one moves up, okay? So any point in this space is a mixed action profile. So we could plot the predictions of various theories, such as the Nash as I've plotted, uh, or you can plot the data. And if you do plot the data, it deviates systematically from the Nash equilibrium. And this is exactly the sort of deviation that QRE is well known to explain. Okay, so if Nash equilibrium is the intersection of best response correspondences, QRE is the intersection of noisy best response correspondences. So you kind of smooth these out and where they intersect is the QRE, okay? So all QRE models kind of work in this particular way. Uh, and so um, referencing the previous talk, we'll be only talking about a non-correlated uh, QRE. So we think about the two players as mixing uh, independently, okay? All right, so <clears throat> all QRE, QRE models work sort of like that. Allow, allow me to introduce the, the formal uh, modeling apparatus. Well, for each player i, she has what's called the quantal response function, qi, which maps from her vector of expected payoffs to be determined in equilibrium to a mixed action, okay? 
So as Jakob before me, I'm considering finite normal form games. So in equilibrium, each player will face a vector of expected payoffs, each element corresponding to the payoff to a particular action. This QI function maps that to a mixed action. Okay. And then in equilibrium, we have fixed point consistency. So sigma ij, the probability player i takes action j, is consistent with her quantal response to her equilibrium expected uh, uh, action vector, uh, payoff vector, which depends on the actions of others similarly determined in equilibrium. Okay. So all QRE models are the same up to the restrictions imposed on this Q function. So in common practice, what people do is they assume a logit quantal response. So they parametrize the quantal response function as follows, where lambda is a free parameter. And so what people do is they'll look at experimental data, and then they'll choose this lambda optimally so as to best explain that data. So here is the set of uh, logit QRE for the same example game. So basically, you fix a particular value of lambda. You draw the associated best response curves where they intersect is the associated uh, logit QRE. And by choosing different values of lambda, you sort of trace out uh, this arc, okay? And that's the entire set of predictions attainable by logit QRE uh, within the family of uh, logit responses. So this model has good and bad features. A good feature is that it makes very precise predictions. Uh, so in this game, uh, for any given value of lambda, there's a unique quantal response equilibrium. A negative aspect of this model is that it's very intractable uh, in the sense that for a fixed value of lambda, a logit QRE is a solution to a non-polynomial system of equations. So if you, you choose an arbitrary point on this arc, we can only find it through numerical approximation. So there's a lot of uh, uh, research, as, as, uh, as Jakob has suggested, on numerically approximating these, these arcs but it has to be done uh, numerically, okay? And that's an issue for various theoretical analyses that we would like to do. All right, so at the other extreme, <clears throat> Gore and co-authors introduce what's called regular QRE. And so here, the quantal response function QI for player I is taken as the primitive of the model. And on this, we impose a, a number of axioms, okay? And, and that's it, that's the whole model. <clears throat> So each player i is allowed their own quantal response function indexed by i, and it just has to satisfy these restrictions. So there's two technical restrictions that I'll abstract from, and then two behavioral restrictions, which I'll explain. So responsiveness concerns changes in payoffs. This says if you increase the payoff to some action while holding fixed all the other payoffs, you take that now higher payoff action with an even higher probability. So this concerns changes in payoffs. Monotonicity, by contrast, concerns levels of payoffs. This says, give, given the payoffs to any two actions, you take the higher payoff action more often. So if you have only two actions, this says that if uh, you take the action that yields the higher payoff at least 50% of the time, okay? And so this is the set of all regular QRE for the same example game. So here we see that it is a union of rectangles in this space. Um, and we, we know exactly what these rectangles are. So we have an exact characterization in closed form for the entire set of these generalized equilibria. And so to be clear, if and only if the data is inside one of these gray rectangles, can we rationalize it via noisy best response curves that satisfy uh, these uh, axiomatic restrictions, okay? And again, each player is allowed their own curve and so it's the flexibility of each player having their curves uh, being drawn independently, which makes these rectangles easy to characterize, okay? And so this is, that's a nice feature that it's easy to characterize these rectangles. So with pen and paper, you could write down this entire equilibrium set. A negative aspect of this model is that it, it gives rise to a large measure of predictions uh, and uh, as I would also argue, some of the, these predictions are actually implausible. I should add that unlike logit QRE, regular QRE is essentially never used in practice. I'm not entirely sure why. I think it's because people like a more precise model and something that they can uh, numerically approximate and fit to data. Okay. 
So what we do in this paper is we introduce a model which formally sits between logit and regular QRE in terms of flexibility. So it's a refinement of regular QRE. And to the extent that it does refine regular QRE, it imposes bounds on logit QRE. So this model is literally regular QRE. So it's a model of that nature in which we impose some additional axioms. Um, and I'll argue that this model balances the trade-offs of these two extreme theories. It's somewhat tractable, more like regular QRE, and it makes somewhat precise predictions, more like logit QRE. So in the same example game, if this is the set of logit QRE, and this is the set of regular QRE, this here is the set of symmetric QRE, okay? So we have an exact characterization of what the set is, and it has a much smaller measure of predictions than the, the rectangular sets. Okay, so an outline of the talk, I don't think I'll get to all of it. The main result is a representation theorem, so somewhat analogous to, to what uh, decision theorists use uh, for characterizing these equilibrium sets for symmetric QRE. I'll quickly give the model, then I'll give the representation theorem, and then in the, in the final minute, if there's time, I'll flash some pictures just to give you a flavor of the sort of games that I've looked at. Okay? All right. So here's the model. It's exactly regular QRE. So that is, uh, we allow for any quantile response function QI that satisfies the regularity axioms R1 through R4. And then we'll augment these axioms with the uh, axioms S1 to S3 in red. Okay? And these, again, embody various symmetries across players uh, and actions. So translation invariance says that quantile response is the same up to a translation of payoffs. So if you add the same constant to each payoff in the vector, it doesn't affect the resulting quantile response. Label independence says that players don't favor some actions a priori uh, just because of their labels. So this is sort of like an exchangeability condition, which just says only payoffs matter for the resulting quantal response. Now the main axiom is player symmetry, <clears throat> which says that if two players have the same number of actions, then they use the same quantal response function. So QI is equal to QJ, okay? And so if you will, <clears throat> in logit QRE, it's assumed that both players use the same quantal response function because they're within this logit family, and we assume that they have the same lambda. So what we're doing is <clears throat> using an analogous symmetry assumption, but without any of the uh, structure of logit, okay? And so <clears throat> let me also note that um, this has various micro foundations uh, and is consistent with a population interpretation of the game. So it can be that each player represents a population of individuals with heterogeneous noise levels. As long as different players are drawn from the same population, then the resulting model would satisfy these axioms. So we think of symmetry not as a homogeneity assumption, but rather as a, a symmetry assumption. Okay. All right. So let me give the representation theorem. And then if I have time, I'll flash you some pictures so you have a sense of uh, the sort of things that you get from, from the theorem. So a bit of housekeeping, let L be the set of all logit QRE, S the set of all symmetric QRE, R the set of all regular QRE. So in the example game, L would be the arc, S would be the union of, of four polytopes, and R would be the union of those two rectangles. We have this particular nesting relationship and what we want to do with this representation theorem is to characterize the set S, okay? All right, so for simplicity, for purposes of, of the talk, I'll consider only binary action games in which each player has exactly two actions, okay? There's a sense in which this generalizes, uh, but admittedly, I think the binary action case is the one for which this theory is the most practical, okay? And already with binary action games, it allows us to consider many interesting games uh, that, that economists and computer scientists have studied, uh, and especially a lot of uh, games that have been played in the lab, okay? So SQRE restrictions depend on being able to make uh, comparisons across players. So to this end, we'll define three player orders. So these are orders across players that are defined for fixing a game and fixing a mixed action profile. 
So it's as if we observe for each player their mixed action and the associated expected, expected payoff vectors that they face. Okay? So the first order, we say that player I faces higher stakes than player J. If player I has a higher absolute expected payoff difference than player J. So each player has two actions. So in equilibrium, we can define the stakes uh, the, as the absolute difference in payoffs between those two actions. And we say that player I faces a higher stakes than player J if this absolute expected payoff difference is larger for I than J. Okay. Player I is more accurate than player J if she takes her action, which for her yields the higher payoff, more often than does player J take the action which for her yields the higher payoff. Okay. So I'm player I, I have some action that yields the higher payoff. I take that with some probability. Similarly, you have an action which for you yields the higher payoff. You take that with some probability. If I take my high payoff action more than you take your high payoff action, then we say that I am more accurate than you, okay? Next, we say that player I is more extreme than player J if she takes some action with a higher probability than player J. So I have two actions that I take with probability P and one minus P. You have two actions which you take with probability Q and one minus Q. We say that I am more extreme than you if the max of P and one minus P is greater than the max of Q and one minus Q. And so unlike the accuracy and stakes order, this order doesn't actually depend at all on payoffs. Okay. All right. So in the final 30 seconds or so, I'll give the representation theorem and then just flash a bunch of uh, pictures. So this is a characterization of the set of regular QRE. Uh, R, the set of regular QRE, this is the largest subset of the simplex, the largest subset of mixed action profiles, such that each player I is more accurate than the player who uniformly mixes, which is to say that each player takes the high payoff action more often than not. So the set S, the set of symmetric QRE, this is the largest subset of mixed action profiles, such that the same condition is true. And players have the same order by accuracy as well as stakes. Okay? So basically, it's the set of regular QRE in which there's some additional restrictions across players. And so in the interest of time, let me just give you the final version of the theorem defined by uh, X, the set of mixed action profiles, such that players have the same ranking by extremeness, which is this weak order that doesn't depend on payoffs, as they do by stakes. The set of symmetric QRE is the set of regular QRE intersected with this new set X, which contains all of the uh, information about comparisons across players. Therefore, to characterize the set of symmetric QRE, you characterize the set of regular QRE, you characterize the set of the set X, and then you simply take the intersection, okay? And so with this representation theorem, I have a complete characterization for all uh, two by two games, uh, which has implications for equilibrium selection in coordination games. And then um, in the paper, I study a number of applications. Uh, so I consider a, 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 a voting type game uh, I consider a jury voting type game, and I consider various versions of the infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma. And we get nice uh, pictures such as these. So we have a complete characterization of the equilibrium set, uh, which imposes uh, restrictions on the regular set and imposes bounds on the set of logit QRE. Okay. And uh, I'll, I'll stop there so I can uh, take a question. Great, thank you. I guess I can ask a question. So you showed us these nice pictures, and I was, I was curious how representative they were, because I mean, you handpicked some games here, right? So um, do we know, like, generally that the QRE set is one-dimensional? What properties of those pictures extend? Um, well, so <clears throat> in order to be able to draw uh, pictures like this, um, you, you sort of need to 
um, fit the game into uh, sort of like a two by two kind of picture. So it's clear how to do it for explicitly two by two games. Uh, the sort of games that I, I consider in the paper are games of, of many players uh, with say two, two representative types. And what I do is I characterize the entire set of semi-symmetric QRE, whereby players of a given type have the same behavior. Uh, and then I could, I could similarly draw the pictures in this space, uh, though sometimes they have uh, nonlinear uh, boundaries. So um, I think for any game that can be fit into that framework, it's very easy to, to numerically approximate the boundaries of these sets. Um, the, the applications I consider in the paper are such that I have uh, closed form solutions for, for all of these, these sets. So, so again, this representation theorem is, is quite general, but it, it depends on being able to characterize the set R uh, and the set X. Uh, and so um, I don't have a general uh, result for when it's easy to characterize these two sets, um, except to say that I have a complete characterization for all two by two games, um, but I have a number of uh, examples. Um, so uh, I, I think it's broadly applicable, uh, but yeah, I think that's all I can say. Got it. Okay, thank you. All right, so we're all set with this. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Quick question. If if you if you speak up, I think I can I can hear. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, so, so I'm curious. Uh, in cases where you can characterize the sets to it, uh, you need to characterize the, the whole set of the figure. Would it be possible to apply it in some let's say? Uh, so, so yeah, I, I don't think I really uh, heard fully or, or understood the question. Um, but well, you know, you maybe I can say something uh, without taking up too much time anyway. So, so I, I guess you're referring to some kind of extensive form game. Is that? Ah, okay. I think, yeah. I, I think, I think I get it. So, so one thing that I think is exciting uh, about about these sorts of uh, set valued concepts is, um, you, you know, if you if you restrict attention to a certain game class, um, and then you have a, a designer with some objective, um, I think it, these models would lend themselves to something like uh, robust mechanism design. So it might be that an extreme point of this set is somehow optimal for the designer. And then you could simply do comparative statics with respect to that extreme point. And then you, you have uh, you know, a, a, the optimal robust mechanism within some restricted class. So yeah, I think that would be, would be very interesting. And it is something that I've, I've begun to think about. Okay, thanks again. Thanks to all the speakers. Great. Oh, yep. I I do. Part of uh, special cases of games like zero sum games, uh, and like, do we get something special there? Um, you know, I I actually really I really haven't. Um, okay. so um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I'm 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 not sure. So so certainly um, I have a complete characterization for all two by two games, including zero sum games. So I, I should be able to, to come up with a very precise answer for two by two games because I you know I in principle know exactly what th these sets are in, in the, yeah. for these for As these in, games. Like, do these 